Welcome to episode 68 of Game of Thrones Bridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Sansa VI. Sansa 6, a Game of Thrones, the final Sansa chapter in this book. And it's a chapter in which Sansa has uh, a bad time. A bad time. A bad day. A uh, bad few days, uh, in fact. There are no lemon cakes in this chapter, uh, and there are multiple uh, beheaded heads. Uh, so on balance, that, that, that works out to, um, to, to, to a bad time uh, for Sansa Stark. Her lot seems to be to suffer in this book, uh, well, in this part of this book, and that's what she does mightily. We get a description at the beginning of Sansa giving herself to the darkness. Because she has just discovered that her father has been beheaded. Uh, she went to Cersei and, and, and told Cersei about father's plans to ship off uh, Sansa and Arya and all that. Um, she's responsible in some way for Ned getting caught out by Cersei. Uh, and she had begged and pleaded and she'd done everything she possibly could. She wrote the letter for Cersei. She did all these things in the hope that her, her, fa- her father and her family could be okay. She, her goal being to marry Prince Joffrey. Uh, but everything has turned to shit. Uh, and now Sansa is in mourning for her father. Um, and she, and, and, you know, I, I think she, the way she describes her grief, giving herself to the darkness, um, on one hand, it's like, yes, that is, that is very sort of real pathos for the girl who just lost her father. But on the other hand, it's a very melodramatic phrase, isn't it? Giving herself to the darkness. Like, I don't think Aya would think that. Sansa thinks, eh, I'm, I'm giving myself to the darkness. It's a very, um, I think that's perhaps, perhaps the way that a young girl like herself might express grief, you know? Like, I think it's colored by the sort of person that she is, that she uses that sort of a phrase. Uh, but, 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 but the point, the point is that she's in grief for her father. Uh, so she's weeping and sleeping and spending days in her bed. She's refusing to eat. Um, and in a George Martin book, if someone refuses to eat, you know that something's fucked up. Uh, you know it's serious when they're not touching their lemon cakes. Um, and she, she has these dreams, uh, of, of Ned, and she has dreams of ill and pain cutting off Ned's head. She is disturbed uh, over and over and over by that image. And we learn that Sansa, unlike Arya, saw the moment of Ned getting his head chopped off. Arya was protected from that by Yorin. Yorin held Arya's head away, um, so that she wouldn't have to see the sight of her father getting beheaded. But Sansa did see, um, which is kind of interesting on like a symbolic level because 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 you would think that Aya is the character of the two who is more of a witness to violence and suffering she's the one who goes all over the riverlands and sees all these horrible things happening to common folk and the horrible consequences of war while sansa uh stays cloistered away in the red keep um relatively safe from the actual sort of violence and the visceral horror of everything but in the in the particular case of ned stark's beheading the situation is reversed aya does not see aya is spared the sight of, 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 of the violence and death while sansa does see it uh which is interesting in the way that it's like a reversal of the normal situation perhaps page two um, and so Sansa, Sansa is, is, is grieving, and she remembers the way uh, her prince, her prince Joffrey, who she loved so much, ooh, Joffleberry, she would say. Uh, she wanted to please Joffrey desperately. She wanted to marry Joffrey. She wanted to have his babies because he was so pretty. Um, but when Joffrey ordered her father to be beheaded, he smiled at her. Uh, and suddenly she realizes that Joffrey, she realizes what everybody else in the world had realized before her, uh, which is that Joffrey, Joffrey is a little turd monkey, you know, he's a little golden head, rabbit faced, little, little, little turd burglar, little, little shit monkey is what Joffrey is. Um, uh, and she's finally realized that. Um, and Sansa committed, uh, Sansa considers suicide. She thinks, she thinks about the way her father died, and she thinks, perhaps I will die too. If I flung myself from my window, the singers would write songs about me. 
So that's interesting as well, because like Sansa is still understanding things in the terms in terms of what she's been taught socially and what she's been taught culturally from all of the songs and such. And so one of the many things that ladies are, are, are coded to do socially, uh, they're coded to speak in a certain way, they're coded to act in a certain way, they're coded to fall in love with pretty princes. Well, they're also coded, they're also taught to commit suicide at the appropriate moment, like like bloody Ashara Dayan flinging herself from a tower. It's 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 romantic somehow. It's it's story like uh, to to commit suicide in a certain way in a certain context. And Sansa figures she'll be famous. One well, one of the interesting things is that is that suicides are generally not reported or not reported as such in the news in a lot of countries. In a lot of countries, there are rules that you may not report that someone committed suicide, especially someone famous or something, um, because the fear is that if that if everyone gives a whole bunch of attention to a suicide death, then other copycat people will also commit suicide in the hope of getting attention, in the hope of getting fame. Um, in some sense. It's similar with school shootings. Um, there have been pushes to not report the the perpetrators of school shootings in America, their identities and stuff, because it's also seen as a motivation for other uh, people to do similar things in the hopes of getting their name and their face out there. Um, so, oh, what the fuck is that sound? <laughs> Why? Why did that sound happen when we're not even live? Is we're not live, are we? You, you know, the worst thing about OBS, the the streaming software, is that it's got these two buttons: start streaming and start recording. Um, and they are right next to each other, so you could very easily, when you're trying to click start recording, press start streaming, and then, unbeknownst to you start streaming to thousands of people and not even know it, which I have no doubt could lead to some hilarious circumstances. But anyway, uh, of all the tangents, uh, technical tangents are probably the least interesting. <clears throat> um, anyway, we were talking about suicide. Uh, Sansa considers it and does not do it, fortunately. Um, and, and then she describes how all the serving girls and the servants and all the people who fl flit, flit about highborn ladies such as herself tried to talk to Sansa, but she refuses to talk to them, uh, which is a reversal of what was happening in the previous chapters, when the purge was going on in, in the Red Keep after Ned's attempted coup and all of that. Uh, Jane and, and Sansa were trapped in, in Sansa's room, and they were desperately trying to get word out. They were desperately trying to communicate, find out what was going on, what was going on to their fathers. Sansa was desperately trying to talk to Cersei, um, but none of the serving people would talk to her. Now it's the opposite. Now the serving people are trying to talk to her, but she refuses. She talks about how one time Maester Pycelle came in uh, asking her if she was ill, uh, and he felt her brow. He made her undress, and while one of the ba bedmaids held her down, he touched her all over. Uh, so Pycelle really is a creeper, I think. Uh, maybe there was some legitimate medical reason why he needed to touch this, uh, ten-year-old girl naked all over. How old is she now? We should remember, shouldn't we? Not, not very. Is it listed in the appendix? Well, she's, she's, she's in the ballpark of, like, eleven or twelve, I, I th All right, let's look it up real quick. This, this is what's exciting about alt Shrift X. Sometimes, sometimes we don't know things, and then sometimes we we we, we Google them. It's it's gonna be great. It's gonna be uh, entertainment. Uh, how old is she, how old is Sansa Stark at the start of the books? Um, I I think she's meant to be like eleven, which of course is is ridiculously young for the things that happens to her. Uh. uh wow, it'd be great if it said somewhere. All right, it says she was born in 286. Uh, so she's like... Okay, she's like 13. She's something like 13. All right, in in that ballpark. All right, that's a lot better than 11, I suppose. But still, the point is that Pycelle's being, being real gross, and he's, um, he's touching naked young girls uh, in the pretense of it being medicine. 
so so welcome welcome to to gross old man tm in game of thrones uh it's a lot more comical in the show isn't it because in the show they show pycelle uh, sort of like chatting up these serving girls, uh, and 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 like, and he, and he always has those prostitutes in his room and stuff. And there's a bit of sort of like friendly banter among them and stuff, and it's all very sort of upbeat. Um, but I think I think it's a bit less comical by Cell's treatment of Sansa here. It's a bit more uncomfortable. Anyway, so Sansa describes one of her dreams where Ilan Payne is stomping. She hears the footsteps of Ilan Payne coming to take her father's head. This is one of those rare Game of Thrones dreams where I don't think it has some deep hidden meaning. The meaning is quite evident on the surface. Sansa is traumatized by the death of her father. The The prominence of Ilan Payne, though, is interesting. Ilan Payne is, is a fairly prominent character throughout the books. Uh, he, he's a sort of a companion of Jaime and Feast, uh, and stuff. Uh, whereas in the show, he, he's he's sort of absent after season, after season sort of two or so. Uh, so Ilan Payne has 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 much more going on, I think, in the books, um, and may play some role in the long term. Um, and and yeah, she in in her in her nightmare that she has of Ilan Payne, she wakes up murmuring, "Please, please, I'll be good. I'll be good. Please don't." Uh, so Sansa, Sansa's way of dealing with 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 the horrors that she's ex- experiencing is still the hope that if I just follow the rules, if I be a good girl, if I say the right things, if I have my courtesies, everything's going to be okay. She wants to believe that's still a good strategy, um, but but she's starting to learn that it's not. She's starting to learn that if she tries to be good, the prince will cut off her father's head. She needs to use more sophisticated strategies if she's to get what she wants and if she's to survive the Game of Thrones. Um, and yeah, she also talks about how Joffrey Joffrey ordered the death of Ned. Joffrey, the boy who had been her prince. Sansa did consider Joffrey her prince, her little Joffelsby, uh, but no more. Um, it's, it's similar to how Daenerys, in, in, in the previous Daenerys chapter, she, she thought of Viserys as, as the boy who used to be her brother, as someone who was her brother, but was no longer. Um, so, 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 so in the same way, Sansa rejects Joffrey by, by stripping him of this title in her head as her prince, uh, to represent how, how disgusted, uh, she is by him now and how much she rejects him now. Uh, and Joffrey, of course, uh, is a twat. Uh, Joffrey, after cutting off her father's uh, head, he marches in while she's in her grief after she spent these days sleeping and weeping. Joffrey bursts into her room and says, Hey there, uh, I killed your father, yo. Well, he doesn't quite do that, but he just comes in and he says, Hey, uh, you're going to attend me in court, and I expect you to look pretty, and uh, I don't care about your feelings. <laughs> is the subtext. No, no concern comes from Joffrey, no compassion, no empathy, no even recognition of the fact that he just chopped her father's head off. He simply says, yo, do your duty, come and, come and stand by me and look pretty. Uh, so that is pretty gross. Sandor Clegane is also there with two other knights of the King's Guard, and Joffrey, and, and Sansa begs, please, please just let me be, I just want to stay here in my grief, uh, and Joffrey says, if you don't get ready yourself, I'm going to get the hound to do to dress you and do your makeup uh and the, and the hound is really bad at eyeliner so you're going to look like a hot mess and no one wants that it's like those terrible youtube videos where it's like haha my boyfriend does my makeup good boy um except in this case it's it's the hound does sansa's makeup that would be entertaining though um, and anyway, so Sansa's like, please just leave me alone, and Joffrey's like, you got no choice, I'm the king now, you gotta do what I say. Um, and again, and again, we have more stuff about Sansa's nakedness, because she's in bed, and, um, and, and Sandor, Sandor lifts her out of, out of the bed, and, and there's only a thin bed gown to cover her nakedness. There's constant references to Sansa's body and her beauty, and often her nakedness and nudity as, like, a symbol for, like, vulnerability and stuff, because, and, and, you know, of course, it goes without saying that in this society, in this medieval society, the young girl's body defines so much of her value and her identity in the society. Um, and she and she's again, she's saying, oh, please, I'll, I just want to go home, let me go to Winterfell, I'm, I won't do any treason, I'll be good. Um, and Joffrey says, nah, you're staying here, I'm still going to marry you. And Sansa's like, mate, 
I don't want to marry you. I don't. I don't think you. You're quite getting the message, <laughs> mate. You literally murdered my father. I don't want to marry you, mate. And then Joffrey says, mate. I don't think you understand what's going on here. Cause fucking news alert. I don't give a shit if you don't want to marry me. You're still gonna marry me. Welcome to feudalism, mate. And Sansa goes, well, shit. Checkmate, mate. You've got me there. Uh, I actually don't have the power to choose who I marry. Uh, so Joffrey is going to have to marry anyway. And Sansa also says, like, oh, but look, by the way, y- you promised you'd give mercy to my father, but you killed him. And Joffrey says, I did give mercy to your father. If I was not being merciful, I would have flayed him, or I would have I would have torn him. Um, I'm not sure what, what tearing is as a method of execution. Maybe it's that thing where they tie one arm to one horse and another leg to another horse, and they all run in different directions, and the person gets ripped in half. Um, maybe it's that. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, Joffrey's like, well, I was merciful by giving him a good, clean death. If I was not being merciful, I would have tortured him to death. And then Sansa looks at Joffrey and and sees him for the first time. So so the penny has finally dropped, and, and Sansa has really just finally realized the full depth of how much of an evil, evil little lizard boy uh, Joffrey really is. Um, and, and of course, it's interesting that Sansa frames it in terms of seeing, and, and, and it's also interesting that, the, yeah, so what Sansa says is she sees him for the first time, um, and she describes his pretty clothes, but she thinks, how did I ever think he was handsome? His lips are red like worms, and his eyes are cruel. Um, so, so she frames her realization of Joffrey being evil in terms of him being ugly. Uh, she, she, she thinks, oh... He, he's evil, well, therefore, he's not handsome anymore. He's actually ugly. Look how ugly he is physically. She's all about the appearance. And she still believes that things that are handsome are good and things that are ugly are bad. People like the hound. Ugly old hound. It must be bad because he's ugly. Whereas pretty Joffrey must be good. Now that she realizes that Joffrey is bad, she also must think that he's ugly. Um, so she is realizing, she is starting to see past the veneer a little bit, but, but she's still thinking in terms of prettiness equals goodness. And that's another illusion that I think she's going to have stripped from her. Um... So yeah, she thinks that Joffrey, wow, you really are, you really are pretty unpleasant. Um, and she says, I hate you. She whispers, I hate you to Joffrey. Uh, and then Joffrey gets Sir Meryn Trant to smack her up, just like in the Prodigy song. Uh, and he does, leaving blood on his knuckles. He smacks Sansa so hard uh, that his, his, his knuckles are left bloody. Uh, so Joffrey is using his king's guard to beat Sansa into obedience as though she were a dog. Uh, so that is just so much fun. <sighs> um, and 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 Joffrey leaves and says, "I'm going to see you at court." Uh, and uh, and his guards go out with him, except Sandor lingers behind and says, "Sansa." Save yourself some pain and give him what he wants. He wants you to look pretty. He wants you to smell good. He wants you to say your little pretty words. He wants you to love him and to fear him. Uh, and then Sandor leaves. So, so, so it's interesting that Sandor is the one who gives that advice. Sandor is someone who has experienced pain and who now is obedient like a dog. He's burned and now he's submissive to all of these awful, awful people who he serves. Um, it would be it would be really interesting, wouldn't it, to go a bit further into Sandor's backstory and to see some of the sorts of things that he has experienced and to see how that's shaped him into the dog he is now, the hound, uh, and, and, and Sansa, Sansa does think on his advice for a long time. And then Sansa describes, all right, you know what, you know what, you know how I'm going to deal with this? This situation, the death of my father, the realization that the prince I'm to marry is fucking evil. I'm gonna have a bath, and that's and that I would say is a pretty good strategy. A bath. There's little that a bath can't fix. Well, there's a lot that a bath can't fix, but at least you'll feel feel clean and warm and happy about it. Uh, and so she asks her maids to go and run a bath and get some perfume and some powder to hide this bruise. Again, the, the whole appearance thing. You've got to hide the pain. 
uh, for the sake of appearance. Um, and she thinks about Winterfell, and she takes strength from that. So just like Arya, uh, in her times when she's far away from home, she thinks of home to gain strength. Um, and she chooses which dress to wear. She's choosing the green silk gown. So again, Sansa does not have much choice in her life. She does not get to choose who she marries. She does not get to choose whether she goes home or not. She does not get to choose which way her life goes, but she is able to choose which dress she wears. And so that that one small freedom uh, is really important to Sansa. Um, and uh, she drinks a glass of buttermilk. Um, is that like butter beer, do you think? And she nibbles some sweet biscuits. A lady does not eat. A lady does not munch. A lady nibbles. Um, and she waits, uh, and eventually Sir Meryn arrives, and we get a description of his fancy armor. His beautiful golden fancy armor, and his sour, dour face. Rusty hair spotted with grey. Um, and Meryn says that he's been ordered to escort Sansa to the throne room. Um... So Sansa, meanwhile, is like, wow, you, so you're you're the bloke who literally was just beating me up a moment ago, and now you're speaking all courteously to me? Like, that's what she's thinking. And she asks, like, are you going to beat me up if I don't do what you say? Uh, and and Meryn is just like, well, aren't you going to do what I say? Like, And, uh, and, and Sansa realises that Meryn doesn't hate her. Meryn doesn't love her. He just really doesn't give a shit about her. To, to, to him, Sansa is just a thing. Um, which is interesting. In the show, Meryn is eventually made out to be like this fucking demon. Because remember, Arya kills Meryn Trant in season 5. Um, and, and before Arya kills him, they, they turn Meryn into uh, a, a sadomasochistic pedophile who goes to that uh, brothel in Bravos and and beats and rapes little girls before Arya murders him. And I think that's one of the worst character changes that Game of Thrones, the show, has made. Because, because it totally strips away any of, like, the ethical, moral grayness of Arya's assassinations. Um... I mean, in the in, in the books, too, the, the bloke she murders also is, like, hitting on a child and doing some pretty gross things as well. But they really go over the top with Marin Trant in Season 5. They, they make it super clear that this guy beats little girls, he's evil. He's as, as com- comically, cartoonishly evil as any character can get. Um, and therefore, there's no moral ambiguity in Aya's killing of Marin in the show. He's obviously super evil, so it's it's about as fine as it can possibly be to murder him, which is so much less morally interesting. I, I the reason why I is such a great character is because she's morally grey. She's the Walter White. But if you make all of the people who she kills mustache twirling pedophile villains, then that makes I a whole lot less interesting. In the books, in this scene in particular, Marin Trant is 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 interesting because he he's he's not evil as such he's just robotic and uncaring and yeah you could argue that that's a type of evil in and of itself i suppose um but it's far more interesting than the marin of the show who's like hey, hey, i do enjoy beating sansa stark oh ho, ho, look at me oh, evil so evil you know it's 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 just dull the game of thrones the show does that a lot it it it, it, it makes morally grey characters stark black or stark white, and it often sucks. Um, and Sansa, in the books, accuses Meryn of being no shrew knight, um, but Meryn Trant just doesn't even respond because he doesn't care. And, and similarly to Sandor, you got to wonder what's, what Meryn's backstory is. What are the things that he's seen and done that have led him to be so empty? What's happened to him? Be interesting to know. Um, and anyway, so Sansa stands at the balcony, a deserted balcony over court, uh, and just stands and watches Joffrey dispense what it pleases Joffrey to call justice, which is a lovely line. <laughs> what Joffrey is doing is in no way just, but it pleases him to call it just. Him and his counsel, Lord Baelish, Pycelle, and Cersei, three of the most Morally questionable statesman in Westeros, I would say. Littlefinger, Pycelle, and Cersei, and Joffrey together are the government, and they are the people handing out justice. Truly a dire situation for governance in the Seven Kingdoms, I would say. Um, and Joffrey does a whole bunch of horrible things. He has a thief 
Uh, thief have his hand chop off. Two knights have a dispute about land, and Joffrey decrees that they should fight to the death for it on the morrow. Um, and there's a woman begging for the head of a traitor who got beheaded, and, and Joffrey throws her in a cell. Like, he just does a whole bunch of horrible things. Um, Janos Slint is around, and he's also a cunt. Um, and, um, and Sansa wishes that some hero would come along and throw Janos Slint down and cut off his head. But there are no heroes. And in that particular case, Sansa is mistaken, because of course, uh, in A Dance with Dragons, some hero does come along and throw Janos Slint down and chop off his head, and that hero's name is Jon Snow. Jon Snow kills Janos. Um, which is, which, which, which is kind of funny, that sort of one time in the first book when Sansa goes, there are no heroes, is the one time where in that particular case, there is. Um, maybe, maybe Jon will re-inspire in Sansa later on the belief in, in, in heroism and in moral goodness. Because uh, some might suspect that Sansa in the later books, in like Feast and stuff, is starting to become uh, more of a morally grey, little fingerish Machiavellian sort of a character. Um, but yeah, uh, so Sansa thinks on Littlefinger's words that her, that life is not a song, in life the monsters win, she tells herself, so she's starting to, she's starting to connect the dots and go that like, wow, as it turns out, the world is actually a morally fucked up place, Sansa is starting to come to that realisation. Um, and there's also a singer who's brought before the court who's accused of making a song that made fun of King Robert, and it's a song about Robert fighting a pig. Um, and in the books, they, they use Marillion for this. In the show, rather. In the show, uh, Marillion is the singer who, who gets dragged before Joffrey. Um, and in the books and show, the singer gets his tongue ripped out. Um, in the books, it's just some other singer. Uh, and in the books, Marillion goes on to have a role uh, later on in, in, in the Vale. Marillion hangs out at the, in, in, in the Vale. Um, and, and gets imprisoned, and he, he actually gets framed for the murder of Lysa Aaron uh, in the books. Um, whereas in the show, he just gets his, his tongue cut out um, in court. Um, uh, in, but it's a different singer in the books. Um, and, and Joffrey, after all the justice is done, after all the mutilations happen in the, in the, court, in the, in the House of Government, Joffrey comes up to Sansa and gets, says, Oh, you look, you look passably pretty. I'd give you a 7.5 out of 10. And Sansa's like, thank you for your, for your dear kindness, your grace. Hollow words, she thinks, but they make him nod and smile. And then Joffrey takes Sansa off for a walk, and Sansa has no choice but to take it. They emphasize that Sansa has no choice. Uh, pretty much the only thing she does have a choice about is what she chooses to dress. Uh, and Joffrey says, eh, you know, it's my birthday coming up. What, what you going to give me? Are you going to give me a great big cake with my name on it? Are you going to build me a statue made out of lemon cakes in my image? Are you going to write me a poem about how pretty my eyelids flutter? Joffrey says. Um, and Sansa says, oh, I, I had not, I, I had not yet planned what to give you for your birthday, Joffrey. And Sansa says, wow, you really are a dumb shit. You really are just a stupid dumb face, Joffrey says. And Sansa goes, uh, and Joffrey says, the queen thinks you're stupid. And Sansa goes, R really? Uh, and, and, and it actually hurts her. It actually hurts her to hear that the, 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 the queen called her stupid because she thinks that the queen had always been so kind to her. So Sansa has worked out that Joffrey is actually uh, 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 pretty nasty, uh, but she's only sort of starting to realise now that Cersei is also pretty horrible. Um, so far, she sort of had she she had been taken by Cersei's illusion that she was actually like really she cared about Sansa. Cersei says that she loves Sansa. Of course, we know that's a lie, and now Sansa is starting to realise that that's a lie. Um, and and Sansa starts to think um, that yeah, I am, I am kind of dumb. I am just this little bird. Um, Sansa feels very small and very hurt by this situation that she's in. Uh, and Joffrey says, "Oh, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you knocked up soon. As soon as you're able. As soon as you've menstruated, I'm gonna impregnate you with a child." Uh, and the child better not be stupid, because if you give birth to a stupid child, I'll chop off your head and find a smarter wife. You couldn't make this shit up, could you? Uh, because, of course, it kind of also has happened, isn't it? Wasn't it Henry VIII, was it, who who just beheaded a, a whole series of wives who were not who were not sufficiently fertile 
uh, or or just fun to be with as Henry wanted, and so we just kept chopping off heads. Um, it really is the role of women in this world uh, to to reproduce or die. What a hor- what a horrible what a horrible prerogative, reproduce or die, um, and sometimes do both because of course you you often could die in childbirth in these medieval societies where they don't have health care. Um, so that's, that's, that's a worry. Um, and Joffrey takes Sansa up to the battlements and then Sansa realizes where they're going and says, please don't take me up here. And Joffrey says, I don't give a shit about your needs. I'm dragging you up these stairs. If I have to, we're going to the battlements. And so they go up to the battlements, uh, and they climb up the stairs and they come to the battlements and they see the view of King's Landing below them with the Sept and with the Dragon Pit and the Street of Sisters and all these places, but what Joffrey has brought her here to see are the heads on spikes on the battlements. Um, So there's a series of heads, um, and the particular one who Joffrey has taken her to see uh, is her father, Ned Stark. Joffrey, in all of his psychopathic Pathic awfulness has decided to 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 force Sansa to look upon the head of the father who he had executed. Just because Joffrey so enjoys feelings of control and power over the those less powerful than him, he enjoys seeing their suffering. He enjoys seeing their pain, and so he drags Sansa up to see her father. Um, and Joffrey forces her to look, and she looks, and and she tries to look without seeing. Um, there, there, there's a bit where it, in Feast when Tommen talks about how when when Joffrey would do awful things, Tommen would go inside within himself, and he would look without seeing and stuff. And here Sansa does the same thing. She has the same response that Tommen has to the awfulness of Joffrey. She just tries not to even experience it. She tries to go away, which is such a terrible, horrible thing to do, but it's what she does as a way to survive. And so she looks upon the head of her father, tarred on a spike on the battlements, and she tries not to feel the pain. Uh, Fun fact, um, in in the show... They have a whole series of heads, and um, and uh, some of the heads are just like props that had been like reused from other series, other shows. Uh, and one of the heads on the battlements of the Red Keep in in the original version of the show uh, is a head in the likeness of George Bush, the American president, uh, because it had existed for some previous show. And so, and so in the original uh, showing of, of Game of Thrones, you can see you can see George Bush. In, in the show. They, they edited it. They changed it in later publications of the episode. Um, they went and retconned it, and they replaced it with some more generic head, which is a bit of a shame, but originally uh, you could see an ex-president uh, with his head chopped off, so that at least was amusing. Um, but anyway, so Joffrey feels a bit disappointed that Sansa is not as upset as he would like her to be by this, um, but he shows her some empty spikes that he says he's saving for Stannis and Renly. He also points out that Scepter Mordain, uh, the sweet Scepter, who, who, who was Sansa's tutor um, and, 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 her, and, her, and her guardian and, and her teacher and, and so many things for Sansa for so long, has also been beheaded and put on a spike. Um, and and Sansa, Sansa isn't even as much distressed as just puzzled as to why Joffrey killed Mordain. She's like, why? Like, she, 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 was, she was a nun. She was godsworn, is the term. Uh, she, what possible threat did she serve? And Joffrey just says, yeah, well, she was a traitor, so I killed her. Um, so, um, so yeah, jo- Joffrey and or Cersei and the Lannister regime has been pretty overzealous in just executing everyone who has anything to do uh, with, um, with, with, with Ned's quote-unquote uh, betrayal of Joffrey. Um, a little bit like how Lady Stoneheart is overzealous in her killing of all the Freys who had any remote connection to the Red Wedding. Uh, vengeance goes both ways, as it turns out. Um, and then Joffrey goes on about, um, how women are weak, just to make the character a bit more loathsome. Um, and Joffrey says that, look, I- I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some, some, I'm gonna do some battles, mate. Not only am I this, this handsome, just ruler, Joffrey considers himself, uh, but he also wants to raise an army and kill Rob Stark. He wants to kill Rob Stark in personal combat. 
um, and he wants to gift Sansa her own brother's head. And then Sansa, since she's, you know, since Sansa is renowned for her quick wit and her comebacks, Sansa's response is to say, oh, well, maybe my brother Rob will bring me your head, Joffrey. Um, And she says it just instantly, and then she goes, wow, that actually was a bad idea, wasn't it? Because Joffrey then says, you must never mock me like that, uh, and he gets Meryn to hit her again. Um, and she, and she cries and she bleeds after Meryn hit her, and then Joffrey says, you shouldn't cry, you should smile, because you're more pretty that way. He tells her that immediately after having her beaten by Meryn Trant. Um, and then, and then Sansa looks up and sees that they're standing on, like, this, on, like, this platform above, uh, above, uh, up, up on the, up on the battlements, uh, and there's just a gap behind the battlements down to the lower bailey, and she realizes at this moment she could push Joffrey off the edge, and she might she might fall over too if she did, but it wouldn't matter if she did. Sansa would be willing to lose her life. She's feeling so low and so abused and so small right now that she would be happy to die if it meant that she could also kill Joffrey. And for a moment, she almost does it. Remember that shot in the show. One of the coolest shots in season one of the show is when Sansa looks up at Joffrey and she's got like the bleeding lip and she's got like the red puffy eyes and she's got like there's so much fucking pathos and pain uh, and emotion going on in this one shot of Sansa looking at, at Joffrey and thinking of whether to kill him. Um, but then the moment is broken when Sandor steps in and gently, delicately dabs at the blood on her lip. Um... And then Sansa lowers her eyes, and the moment is gone, and she says, thank you. And she's a good girl, and she always remembers her courtesies. And then, the chapter ends. Um, so, (laughs) shit, eh? Sansa, Sansa is not in a good situation. Um, Sansa, Sansa is is set to marry Prince Joffrey, who's got to be one of the worst people in the world. Um, and he's, he's delighting in abusing her. Um, he enjoys causing her suffering. Uh, but yet at the same time that she's, she's suffering all this ill treatment, she also, uh, has the indignity of having to pretend that, 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 that she's got to smile and she's got to look beautiful and she's got to go to court and she's got to be a lady and she's got to say her courtesies, uh, which is such a fucking torture to not only have to suffer, but to have to hide it, to have to powder your bruises, um, to have to say your courtesies and to be a pretty little bird. Um, and so there's this, uh, and so the int- really interesting sort of counterpoints being set up with people like Sandor Clegane, um, and like his whole thing of him like accepting obedience and his place in the world. Though of course, uh, Sandor himself goes through a journey of, of of changing himself, and and you know he does of course at the Blackwater declare fuck the king, and he goes off to experience a different sort of identity. And Sansa. Sansa as well changes. Sansa goes in a different direction to Sandor, I suppose, because while Sandor rejects his place, uh, Sansa Sansa begins to learn how to exploit it and to use it, I think, over time. Um, but of course, there's also all the undercurrents of, yeah, like the, the role of a woman in this society and all of the complexities of that um, and, and, her, and her Stark identity um, and her connections to Winterfell. Um, Although, of course, she doesn't experience the full sort of skin-changing, warging thing ever since Lady got her head cut off. Um, or not cut off, but ever since Lady died, Sansa seems to have lost uh, her connection to that whole sort of magical realm that Arya experiences and that Bran experiences. Um, so Sansa Sansa has quite a different arc to everyone else. But anyway, that was an interesting chapter of Game of Thrones. I hope that you enjoyed. This was episode 68 of Old Swift X. We will have another episode for you next week. Cheers.